Quorum. That's fine. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome to our second town hall. Um, we have a much smaller audience today. And I'm going to attribute that not to the fact that the last town hall was bad, because I thought it was wonderful. Um, and I got a lot of great feedback from you guys. I'm going to attribute it to the fact that it's summertime, so it's uh, vacation time, and it's also Friday afternoon. And I apologize for making this on a Friday afternoon, but um, it's the only time we could get the auditorium and still be in the month of July, and I promised you guys a town hall once a month, whether you like it or not. Um, so <laughs> we'll get started. Um, we have a lot of things to cover, and I'm going to do my very best to get us out of here before 3 o'clock, since it is Friday, and it's payday. And I know everybody wants to go out and go spend all that money they made today. Um, I want to give you a, a recap on where we are with VSIP Veras. I think last time I talked to you, I said we had three VSIP Veras left that were ours, and we were soliciting um, two more from J6P, actually. Um, in fact, we thought we had that taken care of, but it turns out that the two that J6P owned were already turned back into OSD, so we have three left. We are working with personnel to um, get those out to the entire crew. I intend to send them out just like we did the last time when we thought we had nine left. Um, out to all of J6C so that anybody can apply for them. What we will do is um, look at what positions we can afford to abolish because they are, I believe, Daryl, are they not? They're not restructuring. They are downsizing, right? So when we choose who gets to go on those, whoever applies, um, we will consider can we actually abolish that position. And as we've done in the past, although you all may not know this, if we have someone who has some um, personal situation, some medical situation or whatever, we always take that into consideration and um, work with the union on that and, and in some cases have given those folks pref preferential treatment, I guess you would call it, um, if they have a situation that um, necessarily that necessitates us making those kind of considerations. So that's where we are. The one thing that is um, making this a bit of a sticky wicket is, and I mentioned this last time, there is a requirement if you let anybody go who is in a um, premium pay position, and that's all of our 2210s at the GS12 level and below, then that you have to get a waiver from headquarters on it because they're saying, why is it that you're paying someone premium pay, the, you know, the IT pay, and now you're saying they can go away? Um, and that is one of the reasons also that you have, if you do let them go, you have to abolish the position behind. So um, we're, it's becoming a little bit more difficult to actually execute those. But our goal is to get the notices out or get the notice out to the entire workforce as soon as possible with an off the rolls date by September 30th. So. Keep that in mind if any of you are interested in uh, VSIP Vera. Not that I want anybody else to go, but some people, this is the right time in their life to do that. So um, keep that in mind. Any questions on VSIP Vera? OK. NSPS. Um, actually, the next three subjects go together. Last time we talked, I gave you brief um, overviews of NSPS, um, A76, and um, BRAC. And I promised that we would have in our town halls um, some uh, information forthcoming. And I will do that. We will have people who will come in and talk about those um, from time to time. But I also have come up with some ways that we can give you periodic updates on those subjects. Um, I had asked Daryl to have someone on his staff review. Um, we get Daryl and I both get these emails every now and again. I don't know how often they come in, once a week, once every two weeks, that give us what's going on in NSPS or what's going on in A76 or BRAC. And they're pages and pages and pages long. And of course, we read through them and you know we're ready to keel over when we're done. I really don't think, and most of it has nothing to do with us. It's just all across DOD what's going on. So I really hesitated sending those out to you all because you don't have time to read them, nor would you be interested, I'm assuming. So I asked Daryl if he would have somebody on his staff do that read and then just produce a synopsis, a couple paragraphs that says, hey, here's something of interest to J6C or here is, and then refer the people down to the, to the right area. Um, he agreed to do that. And as we were going through that process, we found a couple of other things. And I sent you all an email the other day um, actually, I sent you two emails because I magically sent an email before I intended to. I found an NSPS website that has 
general information and that has really detailed information and you can subscribe to that website if you want to everyone can and whenever there is new information posted to the website you'll get an email and it gives you it tells you specifically where the change was and you can link right to it so I sent that out you guys are welcome to do that and within that website there's also NSPS 101 the basic course about NSPS what does it do for you oh, I assume somebody else just called in uh, we have people on the phone today too which is a little bit different than before um, but I would suggest that everybody take the time to take that NSPS 101 course it'll just give you that broad overview much better than what I could do about what is NSPS what does it mean to you when's it gonna come those kinds of things as an employee what what am I gonna do what do I have to do differently as a supervisor what do I need to do differently we will provide um, just-in-time training much more detailed than that but this will just give you that broad understanding so that if you do subscribe to that website or or go out to it periodically at least you'll know what they're talking about so I would suggest that you do that a 76 um, we are going to provide the summaries as I said um, Kathy Young is the person I believe is that right who is going to be um, reading those documents and then doing the summaries and probably instead of sending them all by email she will just post them out to the Q drive and send an email out that says hey there's an update out there go read it if you like to um, on BRAC we found a instead of doing a summary we found a newsletter that already does the summary which is great and so we're also Daryl or someone on his staff will be sending that out every time the newsletter is received again it'll be on the Q drive and y'all can go and look at it if you want if you don't want to then you don't have to but at least the information will be there um, should you be interested all right um, any questions on those three subjects okay um, tuition assistance I had a question last time from somebody can't remember who it was that one we talked about tuition assistance and um, there is a draft policy that's being vetted through all of the agency um, and I promised that I would try to give you an idea of what that draft policy says now you have to understand that this is a draft and so it may or may not come to pass exactly like this but I've seen it twice now come out for us to comment on so I will just read to you what it is um, hang on one second while I get to that paper it's actually pretty good I mean it's better than what we have right now um, this is a draft I will repeat that ten times because I don't want anybody to you know it's kind of dangerous to share draft policy with people because then if it doesn't turn out to be exactly like this it's like oh, I thought we were gonna get four thousand dollars a year and you only get thirty five hundred or whatever the it turns out to be so please understand this is what is being considered and it will have to be approved um, I'm sorry does somebody have a question okay um, it'll have to be approved within budget constraints but this is what um, headquarters is looking at right now um, to be eligible for tuition assistance you have to be a permanent full-time civilian employee with at least one year of continuous federal service um, no waivers for interns thereby allowing probationary new hires to demonstrate fully successful performance I'm not quite sure what that means but I'm just reading what I have here um, here's the one that you probably because most of us have been here for more than a year except for just a handful of our interns um, tuition up to four thousand dollars per student per year per fiscal year subject to availability of funds okay what does that mean to J6C if I get I mean not everybody many folks already have their degrees and aren't really interested in going to college but for those who are still interested in taking college courses let's say we have 40 people who are interested 40 times 4,000 is 160,000 right okay thank you I don't have my calculator I used to be able to do math but I can't anymore um, anyway if that's what the policy allows but I only get funded or J6C only gets funded a hundred thousand dollars for tuition assistance then I'm not going to be able to fulfill it. it's up to four thousand dollars okay so assuming we get funded for however many people are interested in tuition assistance then we can allow up to four thousand and again this is a draft policy it's not in writing yet but this is what's being considered um, the assumption is that the financial restrictions which was a 25 percent reduction you I don't know if y'all know this but I think I said this at the last town hall 
in fiscal year 06, our training budget was set as a, it was 75% of what we executed the previous year. So if we spent a million dollars in fiscal year 05 on training, we got 750,000. We may get another 25% cut. Don't know, they haven't told us that, but basically they're, they're just saying that's what they did. Um, Training priorities may be reevaluated at any time to meet mission critical needs or assist with distribution of funds. That's, that's a given. Expenses not covered. Textbook fees, which are like laboratory, administrative in general, such as registration, technology, student activity, and other non-tuition fees. And the reason they're doing this is evidently there is a problem. I hadn't heard of this one, but it resolves a perceived issue of students profiting from selling government purchase textbooks and then retaining the proceeds. I, <laughs> my son goes to college and you know we spend three or four hundred dollars a term on his books and then at the end of the term we sell them back to the bookstore. It's amazing we pay like 90 bucks a book and they give us five dollars for them but <laughs> it's better than nothing. But there evidently is a problem in somewhere in the agency where people are doing that with government you know with government purchase textbooks and so that solves that problem. It makes investment in tuition assistance a shared investment. In other words, the government puts some in and so does the employee has to put some in. So it's a win-win approach with mutual advantages. Um, then they go on to say how they're going to execute it through DTC, but you aren't really interested in that, I'm sure. All you do is go and see your clerical person, they fill out your tuition assistance form, you write your justification and it goes on its way. I really doubt you're concerned about how it gets uh, paid. Um, there is no maximum number of classes per term, which before, I believe the maximum was two, and then we even cut it down to one because of the budget crisis. Um, so there isn't a maximum per term, just as long as you don't exceed 4,000 per fiscal year. So that could, um, you know, you could take them all at one time if you wanted, I guess. Um, Continued service agreement, we've had this forever in DLA. Three months per course to begin the first day following the course completion. In other words, if you take a course and it ends on June 30th, then you have to work three months after that. So the government gets the benefit, if you will, from just having sent you to school. Um, type of courses covered, same as always, mission related um, and or career related and priority will be given to courses with the most direct and immediate business impact that contribute to immediate job performance. Um, course levels authorized graduate level and below. And they're exploring the possibility of postgraduate com com competitive through the executive development program. Um, your tuition assistance courses must be identified on your IDP slash KDP. Um, and minimum grade requirement of a C. I put in comments and said I thought that ought to be a B or better, but I don't think that got, um, got to rolled into that. And a drop failed or minimum grade not met, you have to repay for the course. Those are not changes from today's um, uh, guide, guidelines. Are there any questions about that? Okay, and once again, I will say this is a draft policy. As soon as I get anything official that comes out, I will put that out in writing to all of you so you all know what it is. All right? Okay, next, oh, and by the way, anything with an asterisk is some a topic or a question that someone from the floor has asked, either during the last town hall or by sending emails directly to me or up through their supervisory chain. Um, Coop for BSM. Somebody sent an email um, who wished to remain anonymous, and I don't know who it is, but let me pull up the document so I can ask you. When will, or so I can tell you, when will BSM be put through a COOP test? It should occur before DLA takes responsibility for the system. Agree, and BSM has been put through two COOP tests that I know of. They were paper COOP test. So you execute all of the activities with, without actually, you know, dumping everything off the tape and flying it or driving it to your COOP site and all that kind of thing. You just, it's a, a mock test, if you will. I don't have the details on exactly when we are going to execute a full-fledged COOP test, but there are requirements that are levied on us by outside of the agency to do that. Um, I believe that the reason we were allowed to only do a paper test the last time is because we were right, neck, we were right near to um, 
uh, release 2.0, I believe, and there just wasn't any way to do that. It would have put release 2.0 at risk. Um, I have sent an email out to James Mock and Claire Overly. James Mock is our COOP person, and Claire Overly has kind of been our testing czar, if you will, for um, BSM. He uh, manages all of the JITIC testing, and he's kind of the POC for COOP testing. Neither of them are, there, are here this week, and so I wasn't able to get an answer to this, but I just wanted to let you know that there has been some COOP testing. It is planned, and, and by the time we come back together, in August, I will have an answer for that if I don't put it out to the whole group um, during the month, okay? All right. Um, employee placement in the realigned J6C. Last time we had a town hall, I showed you the new J6C organization, but I didn't give specific names and I still can't. We're this close to it. I have two more people to place and they're managers, not employees. Um, but what I need to do then is run that by the union um, and by personnel to make sure that we have it um, organized correctly. In other words, you can't have a 14 in charge of a group unless there's at least two 13s under it. You can't have a 13 in charge unless there's at least two 12s under it. They've got to do that kind of a sanity check. And as soon as those are done, I will put that out and let everybody know where they're going. Um, but it's just just not quite there yet. We are still shooting to have the um, general order written, signed, sealed, and delivered. In fact, we're almost done with writing the general order because you don't have to put names on it. You just have to put office, you know, the organizational structure, if you will, um, by 1 October. If we can actually do a, an op con or a, you know, like start behaving in that new organization prior to 1 October, I would like to do that because I think the sooner the better um, because I, I really think that the entire leadership group and all the supervisors have put a lot of work into this and tried to make this into the best organizational structure that we can so that it makes um, doing our day-to-day -day jobs easier. So I apologize to whoever asked that question, but I can't give you the answer just yet, okay? Uh, next topic, EDC. John Darby, are you here? Not too bad, because he's the one who asked for this, this <laughs> presentation. Um, but hopefully he'll be able to uh, pick it up on the, um, off the Q drive. He wanted to know what was going on with EDC, and I'm just going to give you a real short little um, summary of what EDC is. As we move down the path of migrating everything to the EDC, we will be doing more um, in-depth reviews of uh, that project. EDC is Enterprise Development Center, Data Center, thank you, see I don't even know what it is. Um, Enterprise Data Center, there are two sites, see I told you you should have done this briefing, Sue Ellen. There are two sites, there's an east and a west. The east is just north of here in Lewis Center. I always want to call it Plain City for some reason, but it's in Lewis Center, and west is in Denver. They are run by Hewlett Packard, um, they're just great big data warehouse, not data, data warehouses, they're great big buildings with lots of servers inside of them, computer centers is what they are. And as a result of, why are we, we even doing this? We're doing this because the agency doesn't have enough money to have computer facilities here and in Richmond and in Philly and in Timbuktu and all the other places that it has it, that it has um, in Washington, D.C., they believe, and, and this is true, they can gain some um, savings or, or realize some savings and, and gain some economies of scale if they put all the mid-tier servers in one activity, all right? So there's been a, a lot of planning that's gone on. In fact, Battle Creek has already moved to the EDC. All of their uh, mid-tier servers are, are already there, or the majority of them are. And we, here in Columbus, have been working on planning that activity. We have a um, HP representative Steve Rasmussen, who actually sits here in our building. Um, Sue Ellen Dumas is our lead over that, and Erin Jones is her right-hand man, right? Right-hand woman, whatever, um, who actually work on that. But basically, it, the concept is we are trying all of the, um, all of the um, servers that are over in Building 23, as well as those that are in Dayton at the BDC, are all going to be moved to Lewis Center. Um, at first, when they started doing this project, they thought that they would pick the applications up off of the servers and rehost the applications in the EDC. 
That didn't turn out to be really, really easy to do um, in Battle Creek, and so they rethought that and said, you know, maybe we should just forklift. Maybe we should just unplug and pick them up, move them in, plug them back in, and, and they should work. I know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the idea. And so we are working to plan that with HP. I believe that the official date for us to have all of our servers move to the EDC is October 31st this year. In my heart of hearts, I don't think that will happen. Just August? No, the original date was August 31st. Right. Did I not say that, August 31st? I thought I said August. What did I say? Oh, I swear I said August. I'm losing my mind. Okay, it was supposed to be August 31st this year. It's not, it's not going to happen in October either. Um, <laughs> but right now, now that we have just, what we have done is we have given the HP folks a complete inventory of everything that we own, all of our servers, all the information about the servers, as well as the applications that reside on them. And what they are developing right now are inter interdependency diagrams. Is that the right word? Um, to see what has to run together, what has to run in front of something else. So it's, it's very complicated to do. Um, and as soon as they get those done, then they will actually lay out the schedule of which servers are moving at what time. When that happens, we will have to be working with our customers to say, okay, let's say we're moving DPACs. Then we have to work with the DSCC and say, all right, when do you have critical um, jobs that have to run and when is the best time for us to take this offline for a couple days so we can move it out of Columbus and, and move it up to North Columbus. So those things are yet to come. We don't have the detailed um, uh, plan yet, but it's my understanding that there are two alternatives that are being considered. One of them would have everything moved there by March of 07 and one would be August of 07. Is that true or am I saying that wrong? Yes. Can you stand up? No. Stand up. <laughs> One is, the, the first plan is a combination of migrating to new servers and forklifting, which would be, um, I think that one is the, the one that would be March of 07 completion date. The other is a total uh, forklift of all of our servers, which would be kind of like what they're calling a big boom, which would probably be a big boom. <laughs> I know that makes Kathy happy. <laughs> be able to speak anymore now that she has a microphone in her I don't think I'm any louder now than I was. Turn it on. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Oh. Go ahead. Where was I going with this? Um, yeah, you were giving someone a shot in the arm. Yeah. We can make this as painful as possible, or we can try to do exactly what we're supposed to do, because we're going to have to do this either way. So um, I, I want to, anyway, thank everybody who's been very helpful to, to make this a, as pleasant a process as possible. Thank you. Um, and I know that there is some, uh, there are, so you can just turn it off and hold it. I know that a lot of people are not really um, 
happy about this whole thing, about um, moving all of our servers to be in the hands of someone other than us. But the bottom line is we don't really have a choice. The budget does not allow for us to keep servers here. There's no money starting in FY07 for us to keep servers here or to do the, the maintenance on them that needs to be done. We will still be doing some sysadmin stuff and all that kind of stuff, but it, it's just a, um, a cost-saving measure. It started a long, long time ago, and so we don't have a choice. We just have to, it's kind of like your vegetables. You just have to eat them, okay, whether you like them or not. And so, as Sue Ellen said, we need to make this as um, painless as possible. And when, when slash if we see HP or anybody heading the wrong way, we need to do the right thing, which is say, hey, wait a minute, let me help you do that better, or here's the roadblock you're going to run into if you continue down this path, and I think this will be a better one. So um, we, whether we agree with it or not, we just need to get on board and, um, like I said, do the right thing. Any questions on EDC? Okay, thank you. Oh, geez. I <laughs> yes? It depends. There are certain, HP had some of their own servers in this building, okay? Um, I believe that they didn't have enough, and so now we are doing government furnished material to them. That's all negotiated in the contract. I, I, you would have to ask a contracting officer how that all works, but um, if they are going to own things, go ahead. Okay. Right. It, it's not coming cost free. Okay. So whatever we have running, we pay a percentage of what we're occupying for for the Right. And a lot of our servers we don't own anyway, we lease them. So and that's one of the things that's driving this is a lot of the leases are coming due or, or ending in September of oh six. There were several other comments, so if you'd raise your hand I'll recognize you. Yes. Yes. The question was, does that include the servers at DAS C? Yes, that would be the BDC. But yes, it will. Oh, just in case, just so you don't think I'm nuts, one of the things that came, well, you probably think I am anyway, but one of the things that came out from the last town hall, somebody sent me an email and said, would you please repeat everybody's questions? Because when they were watching it on the Q drive later, they couldn't hear what people said in the audience, so that's why I just repeated what she said. Okay. Any more questions? EDC? I have a basic one. Is there any protection written in there that if things really do go wayward that we can basically have the service back or just once it's gone, that's it? I know you said we have input in it, but you know, if it's not really going right for us, do we have any type of protection? So, the, so let me rephrase. Here, you may want to... Team HP is responsible for a backout plan for each migration. Yes. <coughs> okay, thank you. Let me add this. There was one application I know that came out of Battle Creek. Don't ask me which one it was, but they had um, lots and lots of problems with it when they first migrated it over, and so they put it back where it was, and then they redid the plan, and then they moved it over successfully the second time. So we're not going to do anything really stupid. Other questions? EDC related? Okay. Can I have my town hall back now? It wasn't supposed to be yours. You just lay that down if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, long range plans for BSM. I got a question by email that said, has DLA considered ending their SAP project since several of the services have canceled theirs? 
I don't know where that information came from. Um, and the answer is no, DLA is not going to end its SAP program. We are almost, almost at the finish line on this. We have got almost all of our items into BSM. And um, yeah, there, there are problems, but we will work through those. We will get this thing up, uh, running successfully. It's going to take us a few years. But there are no plans at all to um, back off a of BSM. And I don't know what services that whoever wrote that question was referring to. I know for a fact that the Navy has come in and asked us to help them with their ERP implementation because they think we've done such a good job. And I believe the Army has also asked us the same thing. That only leaves the Air Force and Marines and Coast Guard, and I honestly do not know if they're even doing ERP Im implementation. So whoever wrote that question, if they want to provide more information, I can certainly, I mean, the answer is no, we're not going to stop. But um, I don't know where they got that information or where it came from. So um, we're not backing off, OK? All right, next, before we leave that chart, any more comments on those items? OK, climate culture, which is what I said we would focus on. We're half an hour into that, into this, which is good. Um, OK. Last time we were here, I told you that we had to put together a SMART plan. Um, and we had to pick two to three areas in culture and one or two areas in climate from the Denison survey that we all completed a couple months back. And that, I, that we would figure out a way for everybody to jointly do that. And while I was on leave um, a few weeks back, Bob Dunlap sent out um, an email. Wait a minute, I take that back. I sent it out. <laughs> um, I think he sent out an email that said we were going to, oh, I know what he did. He sent out an email and asked for um, people to, be, to participate in a culture council. We'll get to that in just a minute. I, I apologize. But I sent out an email earlier this week. And it had a questionnaire that basically had all the different areas from the Denison survey and said, will you pick three in the culture area and pick two in the climate area? And then we'll tabulate those results. And we will come up with the five areas that we're going to work on. The reason we only chose five is, number one, headquarters told us to. But number two, we can't work on all 17 at one time. Then we would not be successful in anything. So what we said is, all right, let's figure out what the group thinks is the most are the most important. And we will focus on those. And I have those results. But before I give those to you, I want to let you know there was one small problem <laughs> with the um, actual survey itself. The definitions for two items one was a duplicate of the other. Um, I'll tell you which one that is. But once, once we looked at the results, we didn't tell anybody that. Somebody, some astute person um, caught that and told us about it. Uh, but once we looked at the results, even if, um, even if they had been separate, even if they had been added together, it would not have changed the overall results. Um, let me tell you which ones those were. Let me find my paper here. Here we are. Um, and they're very, very closely linked. One of them was organizational capability. Um, the the um, definition for that was the J60 organization continually invest in the development of employee skills in order to stay competitive to meet ongoing business needs and to support effective empowerment at all levels. That is actually really the definition for organizational learning. And it was reflected correctly there. Um, there were 57 people that chose organizational learning as their one of their top items, and there were 43 people who chose organizational capability as one of their top items. The real definition The real definition for organizational learning is the J6C organization receives, translates, and interprets signals from the environment into opportunities for encouraging innovation, gaining knowledge, and developing capabilities. So they are very, very closely linked. Um, so we can do, actually, the, t the top three um, were empowerment, 
where individually, individuals have the authority, initiative, and ability to develop and manage their own work. The next one was the organizational learning, okay, which is basically training for employees, which I would have expected to be in one of the top three. And the third one was team orientation. No longer can a single individual hold all the skills, experience, and perspectives necessary to solve most complex problems and challenges facing the organization today. Team orientation brings together the diversity and breadth of attributes necessary for both timely and effective action. So what I'd like to do is throw out to the, then in fourth place, no, it was in fifth place, would have been the organizational capability with the wrong definition. So as a group, I was going to ask, do we just want to go with the three that came up as the top three and assume we'll pick up organizational capability later? Do we, I only have until next Friday to put the SMART plan together. Do we want to redo the survey? Um, or do we just assume that we'll catch that one next time? I'm kind of looking to you guys. I don't want to make any decisions um, without your input. Or another choice I had, or another idea I had is, I told you that we um, established a J6C Culture Council. Do we want to put it in their hands to let them make the decision what to do with this anomaly? Um, any ideas? Nobody cares? We don't want to take the survey. <laughs> okay, good. That's what I figured. That's what I figured. I'm sorry? Let the culture council. Let the culture council. Well, since I've kind of talked about that, let me tell you, before we make a decision on this, let me, um, well, first, I'm sorry. I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, I told you we had to pick two areas in um, the climate area. Okay, the two that came up as most important by your, um, by your vote is your level of job satisfaction, individual job satisfaction, and interaction with DLA and the J6 organization. Okay? Those both had 72 and 64 um, votes respectively. By the way, we had 149 people who actually responded to the survey, so just a little bit less than half, which isn't too bad, I don't think. Um, Anyway, so as we, are, as we are trying to move down this path of making our climate and culture better, one of the things that um, we did, Bob and I, Bob Dunlap, who I know a lot of you haven't met, and he was on um, leave last time we had a town hall or I would have introduced him, and today he's on TDY, so <laughs> I still can't introduce him, but hopefully he'll be here next time. He and I met with DSCC Command. DSCC is kind of a front runner in the agency for climate culture. So we met with their deputy commander, uh, Jim McClarity, and their culture champion, um, Dennis Canterbury, last week, I want to say. Yeah. And we talked to them about what are the kinds of things you have done that has improved your um, climate and culture. And um, we brought those back. Uh, one of the things that we uh, got from them is they have a culture council. And this is the email that I told you about a few minutes ago that Bob sent out while I was on leave and said, hey, would you all like to have a culture council? And if you do, come to a, a meeting in room, whatever room it was. And we got a lot of volunteers for that. In fact, um, we'll come back to this chart. But here are the people who actually um, signed up to be on that culture council. Um, all the people at the top are employees. And then we have two management representatives. The management representatives are not actually voting members of the Culture Council, but they are there to be a liaison back to management and to remove any roadblocks that there may be or to answer questions that, you know, the Culture Council, let's say they come up with an idea that, um, oh, I'm trying to think of one. Um, they come up with the idea that every person should get every Friday afternoon off for free. <laughs> and that's a great idea. I would love to do that. but. The, you know, the employees may not know that that would require an act of Congress and a change of OPM guidelines. But, you know, and so the management representatives can say, as, even though that's a really great idea and I think that would probably really greatly improve morale, here's what we would have to do to get there. And then they'll say, ah, that's probably not the greatest idea. Let's think of something that is more doable. So, um, and if they come up with an idea that's going to require um, some changes in policy or regulation, then the management representatives are there to help them. If it's something that's within our, um, our jurisdiction, if you will, they're there to help them get through those hoops. 
um, as well as to help them, you know, how do you send out information to all the employees, those kinds of things. So they're, they're kind of in a um, sideline advisory capacity, but not actually on the Culture Council. Um, incidentally, I met with the Culture Council. Bob met with them the first time that they met because I was on leave. Then I met with them the second time, and what I did is passed by them all of the different things that DSCC Command told us that they were doing for climate and culture and said, which ones do you think are good and which ones would you like me to present to the group at large during the next town hall? And that's what I want to talk about right now, okay? So we solicited some volunteers and the group was formed and then they met with the deputy and um, with myself. One of the things that DSCC does and that the climate culture or the Culture Council thought was a, a great idea is there's also a supervisory slash leadership council and basically you know I, I told you last time at the town hall we have what's called a leadership group and that's all the 14s and myself here um, in J6C. There's not really a council or a group of all of the first line supervisors. DSCC has one and it's their supervisory council and they said that it's been very very um, beneficial that once a month, however often they think it's necessary, every other week, whatever, that whole group meets together and they talk about um, challenges and or successes that they've had um, in being a first line supervisor. For example, one supervisor may say, you know what I have really started doing to my people, whenever anybody does anything that's you know above and beyond, I give them an all in the spot and it has just raised the morale so much in my group. And then the other supervisors say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Or I give my people 59 minutes off you know, every now and again just because it's hot on a Friday afternoon and we're all you know, worn out. And they say, yeah, I think that's a great idea too. Also, they can share the fact that, you know, I have this one person, I just cannot get them to do anything. I, you know, I've called them in and counseled them, I've done this, and then someone else can raise their hand and said, well, yeah, I've done that too, and I have, I have a sample performance improvement plan, or, you know, whatever. So they, they get together and they benefit from the um, experiences of the group and they share those. The other thing that DSCC Command said that that does is it makes sure that all the supervisors are doing things the same way. For example, um, last week uh, we got, it's time to do mid-year um, performance appraisals with all the employees. We have to have them done by the end of July because um, your cycle is January through December, so this would be halfway through the year. Um, and I know as an employee myself, I have had every kind of a, an appraisal, or I mean I've always had good appraisals, but I've had appraisals given to me in at two ends of the spectrum. I've had my supervisor sit down and have a copy of my performance standards and we read through what is exceptional and what is um, just fully successful and what is not successful and then they reiterate to me what I have done through the year that puts me in each one of those categories and why they rated me there. And then I've had the other end of the spectrum where the supervisor hands me my 5 by 8 card and says, hey, you're doing a good job, you know you are, please sign there. And I assume we may have that same situation here in J6C, but I don't want that to, to be like that. I want every supervisor to do what the first one that I described. Sit down and walk through your standards with you twice a year, once at your performance appraisal, once at your mid-year, so that it reminds both you and they of what it is you are supposed to be doing and it gives you that um, focus of what exactly is expected and then there's concrete um, measures there, hey, I am doing an exceptional job. I am never, ever late with the suspense. I ought to have an exceptional in that particular category. So, excuse me, now I have the hiccups. Um, in those um, leadership councils or supervisory council meetings, they discuss things like this. And everybody says, okay, this is the right way to do it. Let's all agree to do it this way. So, I think that'll be something that's good. We haven't actually formed the council yet. And just as we have supervisory members on the Culture Council, there will be a member or two from the Culture Council on the Supervisory Council. They won't be a voting member, but they will be there to oversee and to say, eh, I don't know if that idea is going to go over real well with the employees. You know, that's probably going to make some people mad. Um, or, if you really want to make this better, then here's our suggestion for what you ought to be doing. So, those are two steps that we're taking. Like I said, we haven't formed the Supervisory Leadership Council, 
just haven't had time to do it, but that's on the radar within the next couple of weeks that we will be doing that and establishing those meetings. Then we will leave it up to the Culture Council who is going to be their liaison to that group. Um, peer awards. At DSCC, these are actually called Associates Choice Awards. Um, every once a month, I attend, well, I attend the DSCC um, command uh, staff meeting every Friday morning. Um, usually I do. Every once in a while, uh, Bob or Daryl will attend for me if I'm not available. But once a month at those meetings, they have what are called Associates Choice Awards. They're on-the-spot awards in essence, but they are written by employees for other employees. When that first came out, a couple of years ago I want to say, it was available to everybody on center, including J6C. And I think we had two people who were um, who received those, that one of their peers wrote them up for a some kind of an award. And it's a real simple little thing to do. Um, but then it just kind of fell by the wayside, and nobody really does that around here anymore that I know of. I mean, I sign all the awards, and I haven't seen one come through since I've been the boss for seven months. So um, that was one of the things that the Culture Council thought was a really good idea. And so what I agreed to do was to find the person at DSCC who's in charge of that, get the rules, and then it's really an employee run and administered activity. All it really requires is a supervisory signature, but the actual nomination process and, you know, it, that is all decided by the employees. And again, it can be decided by the employees where those awards are given. You know, we do the um, Employee of the Month Award, and right now I go to that employee's desk side along with you know the people who work around them and, and once a month usually at the end of the month give them their um, uh, on the spot and an executive parking pass uh, and they you know award them for being the employee of the month those recommendations and those awards are decided by management this is decided by employees and so it would be up to the employees and again I think we will work this or I'd like to see this worked through the culture council where do you want to have those presentations made since we're going to have um, town hall meetings once a month, maybe this is the right forum. Maybe it's not. Maybe you want to have a separate meeting. Maybe you want to do it just like we do the employee of the month, and it's just done desk side for the employee or employees who are chosen. So I will throw that out there. Um, the Culture Council thought it was a good idea, so I will leave it in their hands then to orchestrate that and to coordinate that among you guys and, and get you all that information about how do you do that, um, of course, it's your choice whether you participate or not, but the feedback we got from DSCC Command as well as their employees was that they just love that. Um, it kind of puts um, employees in charge of uh, their destiny. It also exerts a little bit of peer pressure um, on employees because they know, geez, if I do a really good job, you know, then uh, maybe my peers will notice and put me in for an award. Um, this one, they the kind of saved the best for last. There's this thing called supervisory feedback assessment. <clears throat> and I think that um, if you are a supervisor and in this meeting, you probably just got an email on this because there's a mailing group of all supervisors in ATAPS. Um, we don't actually do this here in J6C, but I think we should start. And it'll be, again, up to you all to decide this. There is, you know what the... Um, the Denison climate culture thing is there's also a thing called 360 360 degree feedback and you can go out to commercial companies and get this but basically what it is um, is and you can do it for employees or for supervisors but there are different categories and people who I'll use myself as an example people who work directly for me would fill out this assessment about me. It's totally anonymous, okay? Actually, we wrote the program that DSCC uses, which is kind of great, um, and their assessment is based on the DSCC way. Not all of that applies to us, but if we wrote the program, we can certainly make our own version of it. And again, I hope to work through the, the climate, or the culture council um, to come up with weeding out, you know, what may or may not be um, applicable to us. And, and when I say that, DSCC does this thing called a social contract. We don't do social contracts here, and so we would take out those questions resulting or um, regarding social contract. But the whole point of it is <laughs> that every so often, and we can set the time period. We can make it six months, twelve. I mean, you don't want to make it every two weeks, but six months, twelve months, whatever, nine months, whatever is reasonable 
by your um, opinion, um, you will get a chance to, as an employee, rate your supervisor. Okay, not their performance rating, but you'll get to rate them. Are they a good communicator? Do they treat all the employees fairly, regardless of their um, background or ethnic? I can't say that word. Whoever said it, thank you. <laughs> um, do they pass out work to all people fairly? Um, do they those kinds of things? Um, and what happens is there's a you know there's always a bell curve and basically whenever the assessments come in and the results are tallied any supervisor who has um, poor performance in a particular area has to put an action plan together kind of like our smart plan and explain to their division chief how it is they're going to fix that okay and then they also have to explain to their employees how they're going to fix that and let me give you an example if there's one on communication all right and um, I have 15 people who report to me. If one person says I'm not a good communicator, eh, maybe they just had a wild hair that day, okay? If out of the 15 people that work for me, 12 of them say I'm not a good communicator, I'm probably not a good communicator, and I need to work on that, and that's, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. So what, we would, what they do is the first time, you, know, you, you run your baseline, and if there's any areas that need work, that supervisor has to have a meeting with their employees and say, hey, they don't have to tell them the actual scores, but they have to say, it's been brought to my attention that I need to work on communication, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start having weekly staff meetings with you. I'm going to make sure that once I go to staff meeting, I send out the minutes to you, you know, whatever, their, whatever their actions are. Then the next time they get rated, if it went back up into a, a reasonable category, then fine. It, it accomplished what it was supposed to. If it doesn't, then they and their division chief have to come and bring an action plan to the director. And Mr. Max says, that Mr. McClarity says that you know, there's only been a handful of people in their supervisory chain who've had to come to him with their action plans. But he said the one thing that they found as a... Um, um, a common denominator among every one of those supervisors is they did not have weekly staff meetings. Everyone that ended up in his office having to do an action plan didn't have a weekly staff meeting with their people. So for those of you who are supervisors, that should tell you something. But I think this is a really good opportunity for employees. And it ties right back to um, it's a good opportunity for employees to have some say in who is in management. And it, I mean, eventually, if you get a manager who can't get these things right, then it's my job or their division chief's job to move them to a non-management position. Um, and that was a common theme among the write-in comments on the Denison survey, as well as the write-in comments, which we haven't actually gotten to yet, on the, um, the questionnaire that we just put out. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, was that employees are concerned um, disgruntled, I don't know if that's the right word, unhappy with people who may have been wonderful technicians and because of their wonderfulness as a technician they got a promotion into management and they're not all that great at management. And so this helps the employees shape that management workforce and I think that it, I thought it was a great idea. Um, I was very happy to find out we were the ones who wrote the code to it so we can use it for free. It's not going to cost us anything so there's no budget considerations with it. Um, Again, the, the Culture Council thought that was a great idea, and so I'm throwing that out there to you to see if you all would like to start doing that, and if so, we can start um, going down that path. Of course, we'll first have to work with the, with the Culture Council to go through the actual um, assessment that is out there and to revise questions or change questions so they fit J6C. Any comments? Questions? Yes, Chris. The Denison feedback is more of an organizational. It doesn't talk about Chris Smith. This would be a, a, an assessment of Chris Smith as a supervisor done by her specific employees. Oh, you're talking about the 360 degree. Two different things. Okay, yes, and we have done those 360 degree feedbacks. Um, we don't do them very often. I think they're only done every 18 months 
in DLA, and they cost money to do. This is something that we can do as often as we want to. Okay, so it's um, it's a homegrown version of that 360 degree one. Any other comments, questions? Anybody think this is a good idea, bad idea? All the supervisors think it's a bad idea. No. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, the write-in comments. You know, when we put that questionnaire out, <clears throat> the last portion of it said that if, you, if there's an area that you think is important that wasn't covered in those um, 17 or however many questions, or I think it was 17, 18, um, that wasn't covered in there, then here's your opportunity to write in. And we got, um, how many, 29 write-in comments? Um, yeah, 29 additional comments. What I would like to do with these um, is let the Culture Council look at these and decide, are they communication, are they um, whatever, you know, and categorize them. Since there's only 29 of them, even if they were all on the exact same subject, they would not total enough to be in the top five that we just went over. But it doesn't mean that they aren't important and that they should not be listened to and um, resolved. Okay, so what I would like to throw out to the group, if it's all right, is that we let the Culture Council look at these and then weave those in with the other um, things that we are working on. Um, and along that line, and what I would like to see happen is not only with these comments, but also with um, comments from the, um, the larger climate culture um, survey that was just done in the agency. Um, one of the things that I've told you several times now is we have to have a J6C SMART plan by this coming Friday by the 21st. Um, May has just sent an email this week. I have not sent it out to management yet because I wanted to have a chance to talk here in the town hall. She wants every supervisor, every first line supervisor and division chief also to have their own SMART plan. So what I would like to do with these comments, as well as the write-in comments, if we can identify them to a specific area or that they affect a particular area, because some of them actually did not, well, they named names, but some, we'll take the names out to protect the innocent, but they actually named office symbols. If there's a particular one that applies to an office, then that would go into that supervisor's SMART plan, and they will have to address um, what the problem is. Um, those that don't, I think that we can just do overall as a group. And uh, don't worry, nobody's na nobody knows who put these things in. They're totally anonymous. But just as in the, um, the larger climate culture survey, they X out all the names. You know, if they say the, the director of J6C, they might say that, but they won't say Susan Van Meter. <laughs> um, and they have something to say about it. So what I would like to do is take the comments from this questionnaire, as well as the comment, the write-in comments from the overall climate culture survey, and have the supervisors use those as action items for their own SMART plans, as well as to meet with their employees and put their own SMART plans together. The good thing is that's not due on the 21st. What is due on the 21st is J6C's action plan, um, or SMART plan, whatever you want to call it. And what I would like to put in that um, SMART plan is basically what we've been talking about right here. I want to be able to show some things that we've actually finished and completed. Um, number one, we jointly decided what the priorities are that we're going to work on. Okay, And so I will have that as something that was completed, but then I will have five other sheets for those five areas that I rattled off to you as to what we are going to work on. And I won't have specifics in there. Basically, it says what the area is and what you plan to do. Well, what I plan to do is improve it. How, I mean, I won't have specifics about how exactly we're going to do that because that will be forthcoming as we work together in town halls, in other meetings, and as well as with the um, Culture Council, who really is going to be your voice on those kinds of things. And again, we'll send this briefing out so everybody knows who the um, Culture Council folks are. If there's anybody who wants to be on it who didn't, um, who wasn't able to attend the first meeting, you're welcome to join. You know, the more help we have on this, the better. Um, 
But I want to be able to show that we did that. I want to show them that we were proactive and we took, uh, or we had a meeting with DSCC Command, and that we are um, going to adopt some things that they have already said were successful or found were successful. Um, the Supervisory Leadership Council, Associates Choice Awards, and the Supervisory Feedback Assessment. So there will be four things we've already, well, four things concrete, a couple things that we've done, a couple things we know we're going to do, and then those other five things so that we can go to headquarters and say, yes, we have identified some areas that we know need some improvement here, and we are uh, moving forward that with that. Another thing that I can say is we've started having monthly town halls. And I will mention to you that one of the write-ins, and somebody stopped me in the hall the other day and told me they thought that um, having monthly town halls was too often. And um, in the write-ins they said, you know, that I didn't really let people vote on that when we talked about it last time. It was kind of a verbal thing instead of by show of hands. Um, I I hesitate to do a show of hands today because there's not very many of us here this afternoon, and so I don't really think that I would get a, um, a fair vote representative of the entire organization, but I will say this. If you all think that once a month town halls are too much, we can do them once a quarter, we can do them every other um, month, whatever, okay? And so I would suggest that you um, send that up through your culture council. Okay, if y'all feel strongly about that, that's fine. I mean, I, I love getting up here and talking. I could talk for hours and hours, but if you don't want to come and listen, that I'm, it won't offend me. Um, I, uh, the person that stopped me in the hall said, do you really think you'll have stuff to talk about every month? I said, oh yeah, there's always stuff going on and things that I think you would be interested in hearing, but I don't want to bore you to death. And I know you have other things to do, so I will leave that up to you, um, whether you want to, how often you want to have these town halls. Um, right now, I'm going to go for monthly until I hear through the climate or through the culture council that, hey, 87 people have come to me or sent me an email and said they don't want to listen to you once a month. Once a quarter would be fine. So whatever you want is fine with me. Okay? Any questions? All right. Well, even though there isn't a whole, I mean, I don't know how many people we probably have in here today. I'm not good at doing that kind of um, counting, but do these things that I've talked to you about today seem reasonable as a path to move forward on climate culture, or do you think I'm all wet? If you do, I'd love to hear any suggestions that you all have about better ways to do this. Um, as I said, we're kind of in a, a crunch for time. If you don't feel comfortable speaking out here, you are welcome to send an email to me, okay, or if you want to remain anonymous, you can send it to your supervisor or tell your supervisor and they'll keep you anonymous and send it to me. Okay, um, so I guess I'm going to do this like by exception. If I don't hear anything to the contrary, I will assume most people are in agreement with this and think that it's a reasonable way to go. And what I intend to do is as we jointly, management and um, employees, come up with ideas, we will let them go past or through that culture council and they will be the ones who need to go out and get feelers from everybody and say hey do we think that's a good idea and they can call meetings whenever they want y'all can attend if you want to um, I would encourage you to do that because you're really kind of um, in charge of your own fate at that point um, as far as do we want to do this or do we not want to do this if you'd never say no and then you know you don't like it then well you had your chance so if you don't like it then you need to speak up Okay, either anonymously or in here. So I have to have our SMART plan to headquarters. What I will do is um, put that together next week with the things that we've talked about here. Um, I will send a copy out to everybody so you know what's in the SMART plan. Excuse me. Um, so if you have huge misgivings with it or misgivings with any part of it, please let me know by Monday so that we can, you know, get that back out, talk to the Culture Council, and and figure out a different path to go down. Okay, any questions on that part? All right, um, I already gave you the team members, and now we're just going to have open discussion, but I do want to flip through just a couple of um, pages that I have here, just to make sure I did not forget anything. Oh, see, I'm glad I'm going through this, because there is one thing. Um, 
Most of the questions that came up at last town hall I have addressed at this town hall, just as I promised. But there was one thing that Frank Spayitz brought up that I have not yet done. Um, he said that we will need to, and this is paraphrase, we'll need to assure there's a personnel rep, you know, a DHRC person, in future meetings to provide information on processes for folks if we're not selected in the 2009 A76, um, and also the length of time to implement it. Um, I have not answered the length of time to implement it. Um, I thought it was two years, but I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure on that. And I, we will have people here who will talk to us about A76. It's just a little bit too early in that um, process to start doing that. But that will be coming. So I still have that on my to-do list. I will not forget that. But I believe that I have answered all the other um, uh, questions that came out. Okay. Um, okay, I think that those are all the things that I wanted to cover, but I do want to open up the floor for anybody who has um, questions or comments on any subject. I'll try to address them as best I can. None? Okay, that's great. I promise to try to get you out of here before 3. It's 10 after 2. Thank you for coming today. executives when they think about downsizing it's the people that they don't know what they're contributing get downsized the ones that are doing something interesting and creating value I may say you know what we don't need that department or we don't need those particular positions but we sure as hell need those people and I would I am hiring them for their brains to help me create value not to do a commodity like job Yes, tasks have to be done. Yes, people have to take accountability for it. But the real trick in succeeding in a brain-based economy is the ability of everyone to consolidate talent, brains, initiative, and imagination. As a matter of fact, I was working with Entergy Services, which is a large utility and energy company based in New Orleans, and Michael Nigley, a senior VP at the time gave a speech to folks in middle management. And let me just tell you the title of his speech, which is the next slide. And the title of his speech is, is if you left me tomorrow, would I notice you were gone? And his whole point was entreating and encouraging managers in the middle to take on that initiative and that accountability. Now, having said this, let me emphasize something. No matter how interesting or cool or curious or bold the direction that you want to take, no matter how much you are committed to sincerely and ethically executing it, there will always be people who resist you, and you know that, right? There are always those who will say, well, we tried that back in the winter of 82 and it didn't work then, so, or why fix it if it ain't broke, of course, which means, you know, your numbers today are a reflection of what you did yesterday. It tells you nothing about what's happening in the future. Or they're going to resist the most value, they're going to cling to the most value detracting processes and assets and habits because that's what they're comfortable with. And that's why the first chapter of my book, I think, is really critical. And the first chapter, next slide, please. The first chapter is, is based on being responsible sometimes means pissing people off. I sometimes get nasty letters about that from people 
saying, well, how could you use such a terrible language? And you know, I said, look, I didn't do, say it, he does. And guess what? They kind of talk like that in the military. I mean, where have you been? And, and frankly, I kept it because I think it's really important. I didn't say uh, it's important that you make people a little uncomfortable. It's important that it's OK to nudge people. No, there are times you're going to have to, are you ready, piss people off. And you know, it's funny, I'm working right now with the CEO, Dale Gifford, who is uh, the CEO of Hewitt Associates. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with them. They do a lot of outsourced benefits and human resource work, et cetera, and they're based outside Chicago. Uh, Parenthet, I mean, it's an excellent company with a terrific track record, which incidentally uh, just did their IPO a few months ago, and a billion dollar IPO, and uh, Money Magazine said that it's one of the best investments in today's economy. So let it not be said that there's nothing worthwhile in this seminar. You know, there it is. I've given you your hot stock tip uh, and so forth. But Dale Gifford is the nicest guy in the world, low-key, polite, and yet he gets this. He gets the concept of pissing people off. And as he says, it's not like you go into a meeting looking to anger people, but if you're principled, and if you insist on moving in a certain direction, and you insist on rewarding differentially based on who's moving with you and who isn't, by definition, there's going to be some who are really annoyed and unhappy. And that's what leaders have to be doing. I see too many people who are more concerned with being weak and flaccid in the misguided notion that therefore they will be liked. And if they will be liked, success will, be fo will follow. That's not it at all. Again, you don't try to anger people, but you want to, here's how it works. As the slide points out, you want to be inclusive. Everyone's invited to play this new game. And, you know, Jim Collins, who wrote, recently wrote this wonderful book, Good to Great, you know, talks, use the metaphor of the bus. The bus. Are you on the bus or are you not on the bus? I tend to use the metaphor of a train because there's different cars with different functions, but it doesn't matter. Bus, train, you're on it, it's leaving at 8.05 tomorrow, or you're not. Now, I'm going to guarantee you, everyone is invited and will work through the learning curve together. But I also guarantee you, if you choose not to be on that bus, you will not be as happy as the people that are on this bus. End of story. This is what separates wheat from the chaff right away in terms of leadership, and that's why I put it as the first chapter. In mission counts, performance counts, change counts, fit counts, rewards count. Are you willing to go that route? This last thing is the rewards count. I think it's, it's, it's instructive. Some of you may be familiar with a organization called the New York Yankees. New York Yankees has a job description called shortstop. One person who holds that job description is a guy named Derek Jeter. You may have heard of him. There's another person who holds that job position, or at least they did a year ago, and his name is D'Angelo Jimenez, which you may not have heard of. Now, suppose I was to say to you, you know what? You have to be willing to publicly state the two people holding the same job. One, however, is performing in terms of where you want to go and how you want to do it at a superb rate. They are going to be paid and you say this publicly, 63% more than the other person who's holding the same job. Are you willing to do that? Oh, no, we can't do that. Well, first of all, just for your information, D'Angelo uh, Jeter does not get paid 63% more than D'Angelo Jimenez. He gets paid 63 times more. And Steinbrenner is perfectly happy to make that known because if you want someone pissed off, you don't want it to be Derek Jeter. And one of the first signs of organizational demise is when the wrong people are pissed off. When the talented, imaginative ones start polishing their resumes, you know the organization is slowly sliding off a cliff. I don't care how big their balance sheet is. So that's why this is particularly important. What it all means is this. Next slide, please. Your job as a leader is to help people strategically and operationally forget what doesn't work anymore. And then, next slide, your job then 
is to help them achieve new, bold, curious projects, goals, priorities that fundamentally shed the skin of your department, your division, your work group, etc. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is really one next slide, the whole issue of people comes in. You know, we love to give lip service to the notion that people are our most important assets. Then we go to a seminar like this, and then we go from lip service to advanced lip service. The companies that really get it are the one, and basically, and once again, the military gets this real well. You talk to people like Powell and Schwarzkopf, for example, during the Gulf War. They were talking about basically two things. Are we taking care of our mission, which is to liberate Kuwait from the Iraqis? Number two, are we taking care of our troops? Because one and the other, are, they're all parts of the same coin. The minute you start pe seeing organizations start dealing with people as if they are labor costs and factors of production where you try to slice and cut and eliminate as much as possible, then you know you're talking about great lip service. And so Powell starts by saying, first bullet, give me the best. Whatever it takes, pay, training opportunities, development, access to tools and technology. I'll do whatever it takes to get the best. No second-rate stuff, no warm bodies. I'll outsource before I'll bring in someone that's just a warm body. Give me the best. And what does best mean? That's very interesting. Let me read you something about Powell's rules for picking people. It doesn't mean the person, you know, sometimes very often, all too often. I've seen, I was with a client once, and they chose someone for a VP position. Given the bold direction that we were going to go to redefine and reinvent the market, I couldn't understand why they chose this person. And basically, the senior person who talked told me, well, of course we, we chose him for this VP position. Look at his record. He's got 20 pages of resume, and He's got a 1,000 years of experience with obsolete technologies and an industrial business model that is becoming completely obsolete as well. He knows our industry. Obviously, we have to hire him so he can build his own fiefdom and keep a break on to everything else. Now, of course, they didn't say that. But that's what happens. So you don't necessarily hire someone. Powell never says you hire someone that has the most experience in your industry. He's never said that. Sometimes that's worthwhile. Sometimes fresh minds that's a quick study is even better. Here's what he says. Note, I want to just read you this. And if you are going to buy the book, it's on page 168. Here's what it says. Look for intelligence and judgment. Intelligence and judgment. The ability to make quick decisions intelligently. Not a PhD. He's not looking for that. Just in, He uses it in one phrase, intelligence and judgment. And most critically, are you ready? A capacity to anticipate, to see around corners. That's interesting. Also look for loyalty, integrity, a high energy drive, a balanced ego, strong but not egomaniacal, and the drive to get things done. Give me the best. Then, noisy system, clash of ideas. I want an open, isn't that an interesting concept? A noisy system. You know what that tells you? When someone tells me there's never any arguments in our organization, I say, please, let me pull all my investment dollars out of it. Because I know there's nothing interesting, there's nothing innovative that's going on if people aren't prepared to challenge each other. I know there's a wall of conformity and most likely fear as well. Now, here's what's interesting. As long as everyone is focused on the same goal, a la the PAL doctrine, then when people are arguing, it's healthy. Why? They're challenging each other on how to get there. But if you're not all focusing on the same goals, then it becomes dysfunctional. That's why I said the Powell Doctrine comes first. Then you got the noisy, noisy system. 
where people come up with ideas, they challenge each other. Man, you ought to see some of the companies in the Silicon Valley near where I live. They're, you're screaming and yelling at each other, and you think they're going to, you know, whip out, you know, uh, submachine guns at any moment, and then they're having drinks later. Because this is how they keep, I'm not encouraging you to necessarily do that, but I am saying a clash of ideas is important. Unfiltered dialogue, break the boundaries. Show me a company where I can't talk to you, sir, because I have to go through you, then you, then you, then you, then you, and I'll show you a company that's on its deathbed. I got to be able to connect with you no matter who you are or where you are. I got to respect your time. I got to respect things prudently, but unfiltered, break boundaries, bottom-up servant leadership. The whole deal on servant leadership is critical. Powell does this. Herb Kelleher at Southwest understands this. Sam Walton, when he built Walmart, understood it. What you do is you set the parameters as a leader. You set the context. You set the Powell doctrine. And thereafter, once people say, once, you know, basically what you're saying is, here's the bus. Here's where we're going. And once people are on board, your job switches to be a servant. What do you all need to be successful? Do you need my time? Do you need my coaching? Do you need training? Do you need tools? Do you need technology? Do you need resources? I will fight for you. Powell has said that throughout when he was a lieutenant, when he was a captain. He, year after year, he tells his troops, tell me what we're needing. I will fight for you. If you're not willing to fight up and fight out, you're not going to be a leader in your organization, because it ain't just going to come to you, unless it's by serendipity. When the troops are cold, you're cold. I wish a lot of CEOs really got that one. And 50% of the time, if you're serious, Jack Welch spent 50% of his time on people-related matters, running a huge organization, 50, actually more than 50% of his time. He was involved in training. He was involved in management education. He worked on performance reviews. He was involved in picking people. He was involved in tracking their progress. Michael Dell spends 40% of his time in recruiting and follow up, following up on that. If you can get the best people together, good things will happen. Whereas a brilliant plan with mediocre people, you're not going to get much happening at all. So the whole point on people is really, really critical. And I will tell you something, that's a very uncomfortable sort of deal for a lot of folks. Um, let me give you an example. I wonder if I have it here. Yeah. In the 1980s, I worked with Tom Peters. I was a senior consultant with the Tom Peters Group. And we would do these skunk camp uh, executive retreats. That's what we call them. And it was basically a chance for people to get locked into Tom they, for four days at a remote site, and I would help out, blah, blah, blah. I was on, as part of my duties, I was also on the editorial staff of Tom's monthly newsletter. And every uh, month, there'd be letters to the editor that Tom would answer. Now, here's a letter that happened in, in uh, uh, actually in 97, so I was still involved with them. But here, 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 here's what it was. Um, the question was asked to Tom the following. How do you rein in an employee? We know where this is going. How do you rein in an employee who has taken ownership but has crossed the line into a job you didn't hire him or her to do? All right, so here is what Tom responded. It's a lot more fun trying to cool off hot people than it is to try to hot up cold people. You've got the best of the two problems. I would rather be working with a group of maniacs whom I was trying to keep under vague control than a group of dead souls whom I was trying to wake up to the need to deal with this part of the century. So I, what I'm trying to get at is when we talk about people, we got to go well, well beyond lip service. Some people have asked me, out of all the things in writing this book, what is the one thing that was the most surprised to you, Oren, to me? 
And I'll tell you, the next thing, there's a chapter, next slide, please. The next cha chapter was, in some ways, the biggest aha for me. Never neglect details. Beware the leader who says, I only get involved with vision stuff. I don't get involved with the trifles thereafter. Uh-uh, uh-uh. First of all, beware of anyone who calls himself a visionary, because that's a megalomaniac. Uh, people who really are visionaries get called that by others, you know. But the point is, great lead, look, if all you do is focus on, lead, you know, on details, you become an anal, obsessive, you know, cautious, and, uh, I mean, nothing happens. But if all you do is the great vision, then fundamentally nothing happens either because you've got to have both. Powell says if you don't know what information is flowing through your organization, you don't know what's going on in your organization. I want to read to you something uh, from, uh, from the book. Um, and this was back in the Gulf War. The transcripts of the military commander's meetings before and during the Gulf War revealed how carefully Powell and Norman Schwarzkopf, the most senior executives of the command, paid attention to a constant flow of details, satellite photos, artillery movements, diplomatic movers, and so on. And then it goes on to say how they used their knowledge of details to, sh to accelerate urgency, continually shift people's attention to the right places, and generate contingency plans on a rolling basis in real time. When leaders remove themselves from the details that impact budgets, operations, customers, employees, and the like, they lose touch. Gradually, they lose connection with the people and activities they're supposed to be leading. They begin to rely almost entirely on second and third hand reports. They become dependent on gatekeepers who strive to protect them and an obsequious staff who strive to win favor with them. Though they don't know it, their decisions are increasingly made in a vacuum. Relationships suffer, accuracy of data suffers, execution suffers or you get into this weird situation like in the next slide. It says, it's agreed, if they do go out on strike, we'll operate the plant ourselves. Anyone know where it is? And all too often, you wind up with a situation where seriously, the people that are in leadership uh, are out of touch. Let me skip the next slide. Go on to, next slide please. I'll skip the DESPR, that's in my next book, not the, not uh, the, the Powell book. So let me just, uh, optimism, I haven't published the next book. That's what I'm working on. But let me work uh, on this one. Optimism is a force multiplier. Great leaders are unrealistically optimistic. Now, they're not rosy colored glasses sort of people. They are fully aware of the challenges, the hurdles, the pitfalls. But they have an unreasonable expectation that they will be successful. Rudy Giuliani said it very nicely. When the leader seems to have lost hope, everyone loses hope. And I don't care if you're in middle management saying, oh boy, can you believe what's coming down from them? They want us to do, oh no, man, da, 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 da. Or a top person who goes, geez, I don't know. The vibe, and it's not a phony vibe, it's a real thing. I call it in the book, I call it grounded optimism. People want, great leaders look for the data, they look information, they peer below the surface, they don't accept anything at surface values, at surface, uh, on surface value, and they, they have an unreasonable conviction that we will be successful. And that is a really very, very important thing. In fact, the best definition of entrepreneurship I ever heard, next, next slide please, is unreasonable conviction based on inadequate evidence. And I think that over and over, we are finding out in other research that this notion of optimism is really, really critical. Winston Churchill once said, success is measured by your ability 
to maintain enthusiasm between failures. And I can tell you, no matter what you choose to do as a leader, there will be pitfalls, mistakes, stumbles. People will go after you, not just professionally, but personally as well. Everyone loves to talk about innovation, but they hate the innovator because the innovator is actually ruffling feathers and challenging the process and people's comfort zones. And yet, if you don't exude that optimism, who will? The leader has to, you have to ask yourself that as well. As a matter of fact, Jack Welsh, when he was um, being interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, said the following, you can't behave in a calm, rational manner. You've got to be out there on the lunatic fringe. Today's lunacy, ladies and gentlemen, is tomorrow's conventional wisdom. Today's conventional wisdom, I don't care if you're executing it with size and scope and scale, it's still conventional wisdom. It's still tomorrow's historical footnote. So what you want to do is not be lunatic in terms of being irresponsible or unethical, but by definition, if you're at the head of the curve, you are going to be perceived of as somewhat lunatic. And I would argue that that is a badge of distinction. One person who fully understands that, next slide, is Herb Kelleher at Southwest Air. Now, uh, Southwest Air, reasonably successful airline, you know, it's the only airline over the last 28 years that has been profitable every year. The only airline that has consistently won the triple whammy or the triple crown, if you will, of uh, on time uh, takeoffs and arrivals, safety and baggage actually showing up, but they violate the traditional model of airlines, which is to grow and grow for growth's sake, not through orderly growth that you can actually cope with. They don't do a hub and spoke system. Even though 90% of their workforce is unionized, they don't treat employees as cost factors of production. And there is a certain sense of lunacy to it. I don't know if you've ever flown Southwest. I mean, it's supposed to be a low cost. You, know, you see people in the audience are smiling. Usually, if you say, have you ever flown South Southwest, people generally smile. You ever flown United? I don't see a lot of smiles, <laughs> you know? And I mean, United, the largest airline in the U.S., 16 billion in revenues before it became a penny stock, was valued. The market capitalization of United was about $180 million, which means for the price of two 747s, you could have bought the whole damn company if you wanted it, if you ever wanted it. But Southwest does really well. No, 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 not that, not that slide, please uh, go back. Um, what I want to do is talk about Herb one more second, is to understand that what they are trying to do, and em this is the emphasis, they, they, they deviate. They deviate from the norm in terms of their business model and in terms of how they deal with employees and customers. <coughs> one other thing that they do, next slide now, please, is they take Powell's admonition have fun in your command. And you know, it's really interesting. I never thought much about this fun business. Never really gave it much thought. Until, you know, um, in one of my prior books, that we, we did a whole chapter on it, because we realized that one of the best symptoms of organizational decline is when you go into a company and the people, especially the good, talented ones, say, it's not fun anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that people expect fun like, I don't want any responsibilities, grapes, I want grapes, I want massages at all times, and all that. Yes, you should have parties. Yes, you should have celebrations. Yes, you should have informality. But the real fun comes from doing cool things with fellow maniacs in a concerted effort. And that's when it becomes fun. And 
Powell has a very big thing on. He says, I don't want workaholics. Workaholics burn out. They're real narrow in their focus. They can't think uh, really critically and innovatively. And on top of that, what happens is that they get too narrow. They get really too narrow. So to end what we want to do right now and open it up for Q&A, strive for balance. What's really critical in understanding Powell is the notion of balance, balanced ego, balance in work and play, balance in life and work, balance in how you think. And so with that, I think what I'd like to do is just kind of end and open it up for other questions and answers. And a reminder that our phone and fax lines are open now, so this is your opportunity to talk with Dr. Harari. I've got a number of questions here, Doctor. I'll start with this email that comes from Daimler Chrysler, and it says, the people who worked for Colin Powell didn't have to worry about getting laid off. Today's workers, especially the baby boomers, do worry about this. As such, don't bold new visions, quote unquote, tend to be viewed by workers as yet another precursor to right sizing. And might not there also be a certain reticence among workers in embracing new visions or in suggesting changes or improvements that might ultimately make someone's job obsolete? How do or how should corporate leaders deal with this? Yeah, you know, this answer could require 15, 20 minutes right off the bat. I'm not even sure how to begin. Keep in mind, as I said, that Southwest workforce is 90% unionized. You start with the assumption, if, you're, if your organization is such where basically any new interesting directions are imposed, you're not following the Powell Doctrine from be, to begin with. If people are seen as a factor of production rather than developed and being brought into the process, you're going to have more problems. There may very well, now remember also, I don't want to make this just a smarmy uh, sort of people are wonderful and everyone's entitled to permanent employment. One of the first thing that Gerstner did when he took over IBM is he reduced the workforce from a bloated 400,000 down to 200,000. That was not easy, it was painful, but Gerstner's notion, and he was right, if I don't do this, all 400,000 are going to lose their jobs. So it's a complicated sort of issue. My issue is basically this, with any employee, remember what Powell said about don't wed your ego to a position, whether it's a job, job duty, a sense of entitlement, none of us has any guarantees, unless you're a professor with tenure, which is weird. But none of us are guaranteed anything anymore, and it is up to leaders to invite people to join the bus, not just explain to them why, but involve them and share in the rewards and, may I say, share in the pain when the troops are cold, you're cold. I wish I could give a more detailed answer. But the fact is, when we're all on the bus, when we're included, and we understand that none of us has any sense of entitlement, and that's management's job to get that across, even in a unionized, traditional environment, great changes can occur. Otherwise, all of us and all of our jobs are in danger. Doctor, we've got a question here, a fax question from Fairfax County Government in Fairfax, Virginia. It says, if you were mentoring a new leader, what is the single most important thing that you would want to impart? <sighs> Figure out what it is that you want to do that will have a bold, impactful impact, bad language, but a bold impact, a bold value-adding impact on the organization. And if it's a new employee, let me tell you what's something that Bob Townsend used to say, and I think he's right on. Bob Townsend was the one who turned Avis around years ago, the Avis rental car agency. 
And what he used to tell people, and I think he's 100%, when you're newly hired, you're bulletproof. In other words, we say, well, I'm newly hired. I'll better wait a few months or a few years before I do anything interesting, and I'll learn and get involved. Uh-uh. You got to start running. You got to start making the changes right away because you're not going to get fired in the first 90 days. The person who brought you in would be too embarrassed to fire you. You are brought in to help out. So the first thing that I would tell this person is don't wait to do the bold, exciting things. Start shaking stuff up right away and getting inclusion, inclusion and, find, and develop a critical mass and find your fellow maniacs who would join you right away. Question from our studio audience. Hi, David Calloway. Uh, Secretary Powell's been particularly successful at managing up that is, and helping but not appearing to be hurt by less gifted or uh, more misguided superiors. Could you say a bit more about how he's done that? Well, one of the things that um, Powell emphasizes, and here's a direct quote from the book. He says, I have been taken out to the woodshed many times in my career. And there are times it's not a question of who's right or who's wrong. There are issues that if you, in the middle management, say, position, you know your terrain, you know what needs to be done. You got to stand up for it collaboratively, prudently, and you have to have done your due diligence, make your strong business case, and be prepared to get taken to the woodshed. Likewise, if you're a smart leader, you make certain, and this is something that I bring up in the book too, the best leaders take full accountability when things go wrong and they're smart enough to let their people take the credit when things go right. All too often, I see the reverse when I read newspaper columns. So Powell has kind of worked it all ways, but it's not, it's been real. And that's why he's been successful. Another yeah. question from our studio audience. Yeah, doctor, I was thinking that um, if you take Jack Welch, for instance, he left GE and GE now seems yeah. to be in a bit of a disarray. Um, you have the, the, the cult of leadership yeah. versus the culture of leadership Good and point. building a, a, a cult of leadership. I just wondered in terms of, of um, Colin Powell, has he developed leaders? Are there, are there leaders who worked for him or people who worked for him who are now out there? Don't you think that's one criteria it's for seeing how good the guy does? Yes, sir. It's a critical criterion. I can't tell you how often I've come across, whether I've talked to military people or even people in industry, folks who have said, you know, they had the privilege of serving under Powell and have grown in, in the Army and outside as a result of that. I think that is absolutely correct. The best leaders create other leaders and basically work themselves out of jobs, hopefully going up, but they don't cling and hoard positions of power. Yes, sir. Another question from our studio audience. Hi, my name is Pat Anderson. Wanted to know what you thought about Six Sigma. What do I think about Six Sigma? Um, look, to me, Six Sigma is survival issues right now. Because in a fragmented marketplace, customers who have lots of choices will expect that the electrons work that you deliver on time, that you meet specs, and that you do it in a relatively flawless way, which is what Six Sigma, even Seven Sigma, start moving. But the fact of the matter is, if you're putting out a commodity product or service, or one that's undifferentiable, focusing solely on Six Sigma will not be your salvation. It's like a, um, I don't know if, if this was said, uh, as a joke or not, but a colleague of mine was working with someone and who, who told him, uh, he says, you know, before we did our big TQM programs, the rap on us was that we made, we churned out poorly made products that customers didn't want. Now, after TQM, everything has changed. Now we churn out well-made products that customers don't want. So ultimately, uh, this is why 
There are Baldridge Award winners that have declared Chapter 11 a few years after winning Baldridge. You need the quality. You need Six Sigma sort of thinking. But you also have to be thinking about what exactly am I providing the marketplace that's better, that's different, that's head and shoulders unique from what someone else is. We have another question for you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Harari. I'm Pat Wiggenhorn, and I'd like to speak to the point you just made about broken companies, companies that win Baldrige and then start to fall apart. Uh, when you compare Southwest Airlines and United, for example, United at one time was a fabulous airline. Mm -hmm. Using Powell principles, how would you get people at United the employees of United back on the bus or on the plane, if you will, going in a direction to rebuild? Well, I think there's really two things if you're a senior person. One of the things is this. You don't start with the assumption that you and employees come from different genetic strains. The reason that CEOs have a big motivation to make radical changes is two reasons. Number one, they have access to intelligence and information that tells them that continuing this same way is going to take us off a cliff. They've got to open that up and make that transparent. That's number one. Number two, the reason CEOs have the motivation is because their compensation package is tied to it. And so the first thing you want to do is to make go back to that old thing. If we're successful, everyone will be successful. And if we're not, we're all going to be unsuccessful. The idea, that I could point, name names right now of CEOs in high profile companies whose compensation not only doesn't change if the company goes down the toilet, it actually goes up if the company goes down the toilet. So the first thing is you got to have some integrity and number two, you have to be willing to make information, data and intelligence transparent, which means including everyone in that process. Doctor, we have a, a question from Derek Smith at AIG, and the question reads as follows. How can a leader keep a successful team together for an extended period of time over a series of vital projects? Well, first of all, there is nothing magical about long, intact teams. So, I mean, I, I'll say that up front. I'm not even sure that's a worthwhile goal. But every time you have a group of dedicated people who are constantly morphing themselves into new projects, new sorts of careers, new sorts of spin-offs, new sorts of tests, you wind up in a situation where people say, hey, you know what? I am constantly growing in this job. You pay them accordingly. You give them not vertical promotions, but horizontal promotions where they have more access to interesting knowledge, interesting thinkers, interesting learning, interesting projects, and interesting pay. And if you do that, and as a team, you're constantly evaluating, like, what is the bus that we're on? What is the direction that we truly want to be going in? then you are more likely to keep that team intact. Also, doctor, we have a question from the National Science Foundation in Arlington, Virginia. And it says, how do your leadership principles apply to a not-for-profit organization? Well, even if you're not for profit, your revenues still have to exceed expenditures, do they not? Uh, unless you're going to be subsidized, which many nonprofits are not going to be. If anything, the great management guru Peter Drucker says that more and more for-profits should really run themselves as if they are not-for-profits, which means if you're a not-for-profit, the only way you can get employees to work hard for you is to have a cause that you're really working them, you know, getting them involved with. You have to be very open, very honest, have total integrity, have a clear mission that makes some sense and that will attract donors as well as volunteers. In many ways, I think for-profit groups are going to learn as much for non, from nonprofits as vice versa. 
And one last very quick question, uh, Doctor, in the waning moments of our time together. Um, how do you align the recent change in U.S. world diplomatic relationships with Colin Powell's leadership philosophy and oh style? My gosh. Um, the question really says, has he changed his leadership style to match that of the president and other uh, senior cabinet secretaries and advisors? Oh, well, you know, <clears throat> out where I live on the left coast, you know, the whole deal is, you know, how, you know, I get pummeled with that all the time. You know, has Powell caved in, or has Powell, you know, basically, you know, forgotten all his principles? I'll ask him this perhaps when this is all over. I, you know, that I would start having to speculate. I've got my own thoughts on that. Um, and I hate to end this program by leaving it on that weak, wussy note, but uh, I would rather not get into uh, that at this. I get periodically interviewed. After each time something happens nationally, I get interviewed, and I got to speculate this and that. But for this group, let's just take what does what he has said that does work and can help you create value for your organizations and your career, and we'll leave it on that positive note. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, indeed, we have run out of time for this portion of the program. We want to thank you for all of your questions that were faxed in, emailed in, called in, and for our studio audience as well. We want to thank everyone who has participated, not only with us here in the studio, but from sites all across the country and beyond. So we thank you once again. We hope that you found the program very helpful and were able to learn some valuable points about leadership style. Please complete the evaluation form at the end of your handouts and let us know your thoughts about today's program. On behalf of Professor Oren Harari and the Federal Training Network, thanks to all of you for watching and participating in today's program. I'm Tracy Matisak. Have a great day.